So what I'm going to do during next uh, 45 minutes um, uh, to share some information about a project that I'm working uh, from the beginning of the year, this year. So uh, before um, uh, going into detail, I'll share the motivation behind this project, why we uh, started um, uh, looking at uh, uh, introducing a new uh, the reference architecture. Uh, so the first thing, uh, the first motivation was uh, we found there's a mismatch uh, with the reference architecture patterns available and the requirements. Uh, so that was the first motivation we had. Then the, uh, um, the second uh, motivation was, uh, I think uh, uh, Tyler detailed explained this thing, uh, the existing uh, reference architecture patterns are centralized. And since it's centralized um, uh, and it's layered as well, so centralized nature of this architecture is limiting a lot of stuff. It is adding a lot of governance, but it's limiting the flexibility. And then, as Tyler mentioned, the layered architecture creating gates, and gates are, again, blocking uh, the flexibility. Basically, uh, it's uh, pr not enough providing support to be agile, even uh, the teams are operating in an agile mode. Then the next motivation is about this brownfield and greenfield. So brownfield is basically the legacy and monolithic applications that uh, we run in our data centers. And the greenfield is the new technologies like microservices, containers, um, uh, functions, uh, so and so forth. So um, uh, the, the, um, raise your hand like if you are completely in greenfield. Anyone? OK. Uh, completely in brownfield. Okay, a hybrid model? Okay, so I asked this question last week at QCon San Francisco, and then there's one gentleman raised his hand uh, when I asked the question about the green field. Then I uh, caught him during lunch and asked, uh, what are you doing and what kind of a project? Oh, I have a startup, and myself and my girlfriend is uh, building an application, so I'm in green field. But the reality is not that, that uh, we, uh, the enterprises are too complicated, and then we have more and more uh, brown fields uh, applications uh, than green field, and we are in this hybrid mode. So uh, the, uh, the motivation behind this, um, uh, the most of the reference architecture patterns are either addressed in brownfield or greenfield. Uh, so we thought of uh, uh, in, uh, when we are introducing this pattern, it should address both brownfield and greenfield and support uh, at the same level. Then the, uh, the next thing is this is uh, personal uh, uh, I believe that I have most of the reference architecture patterns are not reference architectures. Those are reference implementations. Why I claim it, uh, they are explaining how you can build a solution by using a specific technology. So we thought of uh, uh, take a different uh, path on this and have a completely uh, technology neutral way and then have a, introduce this pattern um, without uh, bounding to any technology, uh, even including WSO2 uh, technologies. So then that way you can uh, use the existing technologies as well as whatever the technologies you are planning to use in future can map it to this architecture. Then the, uh, the next motivation, so this is a picture, uh, 2012 Olympics, uh, uh, I think, uh, held here in London, a game during uh, uh, US and Australia. So USA is uh, behind the score, and their coach, Coach K, he's keeping all these brilliant players in the bench. So I get the same feeling sometimes talking to the architects that they are telling they have uh, various kind of technologies like Kafka and then they have uh, Docker, Kubernetes, but they can't use these technologies because the architecture is not supporting. So uh, we thought of whatever we are going to introduce should support um, the technologies available in the uh, organization. Then the, uh, uh, the next thing is there's a massive gap between what we design or the architect and then what the developer build and the DevOps will take and deploy in the, um, uh, the, uh, their desired infrastructure. So how can we have a connectivity and then use the same thing that we architect, take it to the development and then take it to the deployment and deploy and run in production? So that was another uh, thing that we thought we should consider. Then the next thing is this dependency management. I think Massimo uh, explained this problem as well. Uh, like uh, even it, when we build services uh, using service-oriented architecture, we had this same problem that it's really hard to find 
who owns these services, what kind of services available, and if there are some uh, modification need to be done, what are the dependencies and what are the uh, impact that it will make to the system. So microservices increase this problem uh, because now you have many services, more than uh, we had in the service-oriented architecture days. Uh, so it's really hard to identify this stuff, and we need to find a way to do the dependency management as well as have some kind of governance around these uh, services that developers write. So those were the uh, motivations. And before jumping into the, uh, uh, the architecture pattern, I would like to uh, uh, look at uh, a little bit uh, about the history, what kind of patterns we used uh, so far. So this is a, a timeline that I drew. So basically, we started working on this um, single or mono architecture. Uh, basically, the user interface, business logic, and data bound together in one layer. Uh, and then it changed with the database technologies, like especially, I think, the first one was ISAM, I guess. And then there are various other database technologies introduced with that thing. The UI business logic got separated from the data. That's called the 2T architecture. Then the 3T architecture came. That was the uh, most interesting uh, thing. Um, even I started my career during that uh, uh, time that uh, we had this uh, user interfaces, business logic, and uh, data in separate uh, three layers. Uh, so the first project that I worked, it was basically writing the user interfaces using .NET, and then the business logic was uh, done using Object Kabul, and we used Oracle as a data uh, base. And the uh, same time, a lot of uh, distributed computing technologies came into the picture, like uh, start from OLE, OLE2, COM, COM plus, DCOM, COBAS, and so forth. So with this distributed technologies, it helped to uh, have this proper separation. Then after that, uh, with the dot com, uh, uh, the boom, basically, a uh, lot of development moved into the uh, web development. With that, there was a sub-architecture pattern introduced called the model view controller. Uh, that basically uh, separate the communication in between these three, three layers into a separate layer called the controller. Then the uh, uh, service-oriented architecture came into the picture that it introduced a new service layer. Uh, so I put only one layer here, but there can be another layer in between the data and the business logic. Uh, so uh, the, it introduced the services and APIs, uh, as well as it introduced some sub-patterns as well, like even driven architecture, web-oriented architecture, so and so forth. Then the microservices architecture came into the picture, and it was um, uh, theoretically explaining about more segmented architecture than layered architecture. So the, uh, the summary of this is like there are two uh, spectrums. One is the layered architectures, and then the segmented architectures, as well as there are uh, the combination in between these two as well. So the uh, so this is one of the layered architecture uh, diagrams that we used for a while. Um, so uh, we use this concept called system of systems when designing this. Like we have a source system of record, a system of record layer, and then um, the uh, services, APIs, and system of engagement. Uh, so usually you will see uh, these one-dimensional diagrams, but we did something different by making it two-dimensional, by bringing uh, the runtime behavior of these runtimes as well as quality of services that you can add uh, quality of services without uh, affecting the, uh, the services, basically the security, governance, and uh, uh, monitoring, so and so forth. So we had many productive discussions with a uh, lot of architects with this diagram. And then we built many systems using this as well. So then uh, there was a turning point. I think it was 2010 or 20, uh, 2009. Uh, so we were working with uh, one of our customers uh, in Seattle, uh, Washington. So um, we built a platform with the Agile team. Uh, so it had around 100 APIs, 60 message flows, 80 services, so and so forth. And they wanted to have multi-tenancy, like the pros uh, shared uh, multi-tenancy, with three active tenants in the first release. But unfortunately, even they were using agile practices, the, uh, the system went into production after three years. So uh, when it uh, went to production after three years, the requirements were not matching the business requirements, and it was a failure. So it was an eye-opener for us. Then we looked at, like, OK, they are using agile uh, practices, and they operate in an agile way, but uh, why this project failed? The reason was the architecture 
is not supporting uh, the agility that they were looking at, and we thought of it's uh, enough eating this layered cake, we need to look at something different, which will support and more agile friendly. Then at the same time, microservices came into the picture as well. Uh, there were a lot of theory behind it, and um, uh, the uh, people uh, came up with a lot of uh, uh, different architecture patterns. But when we uh, uh, looked at like the people who was heavily using microservices, they wrote the microservices but wrote different kind of layers on top of that. So the Netflix, they called it as APIs. And then Uber called it as Edge Gateway, same concept but in a different um, uh, name. And eBay, uh, they use something called the API facade pattern. And Gartner even introduced this concept called mini services that acts as a composite service layer on top of the uh, microservices. So with that, uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, enterprises uh, look like this. Like they have the core microservices, but there are other different layers support that to connect with the existing runtimes as well as uh, to do the composition of these microservices and then bring something valuable for the business. So this was the, um, the, uh, the architecture looked like in most of the enterprises. Then I got uh, invited. Usually I submit a lot of CFPs to uh, uh, different events, but uh, if you submit 100 CFPs, you will get accepted, like three or two. So I was fortunate that uh, the uh, O'Reilly uh, conference had in London, they accepted my um, CFP. So I was thinking, how can I give something better for this audience? Because the, uh, the current architecture that we were using, this was not that friendly enough. So what I did uh, look at uh, the, uh, from the customers, 500 odd, cu odd customers that we have, whoever who's using microservices or planning to use microservices, what kind of strategies that they are using. Then the first thing I found, I think uh, this diagram is very familiar for Jennifer, I think. So, uh, so what they were doing, um, basically, um, uh, one, one, one thing they were doing, um, uh, the, use this concept called a segmentation. So uh, they have all the layers, and then the, uh, uh, the enterprise looks like a layered architecture. But uh, within that layers, there are different segmentation. The segmentation done using two things. First thing is uh, based on the ownership. Um, and the second thing, based on the functionality or the capabilities that they are providing for the enterprise. So this was one pattern that we identified, and it was a lot better than the traditional layered architecture, but not addressing all the problems uh, that architects were facing. Then the next uh, pattern, uh, we call it as platform or platforms, that uh, particular centralized, uh, centralized deployment they duplicate it in many uh, deployments based on business units. So there are some capabilities like user stores and CICD processes are centralized, but the, uh, the, the particular deployment is duplicated based on business units. And there, if there's a new business unit come into the picture, uh, they deploy another platform. Again, it's better, but uh, not exactly addressing the uh, particular problem. Then we hit this uh, dead end because uh, uh, we tried many approaches, but it ended up with uh, another layered architecture. So we thought of um, uh, to find a new approach to address the same problem. So uh, Tyler used to tell this uh, software industry is like uh, movie industry because um, it's very creative, and even I agree with that. So um, I thought of explain a little bit about uh, the project and how we make it. Um, what are the steps that we did before come up with this uh, nice architecture pattern? So this is uh, Alex, uh, Alex Ferguson. I think most of you are familiar with him, uh, who is the coach of uh, Manchester United and who built uh, uh, great players like Cristiano Ronaldo and David Beckham, so and so forth. So moral of the story, coaches build great players as well as they provide um, uh, valuable results like winning uh, games and then championships, so and so forth. So this is my coach, uh, Dr. Paul Fremantle. I'm sure Paul is here somewhere. I can't find. So um, um, Paul is uh, the co one of the co-founders and then our CTO. Uh, so uh, Paul took a break in 2014 to complete his PhD in uh, uh, IoT and security. Uh, so um, he came back in 2018 by completing his uh, PhD. So um, 
Uh, so Paul is, I'm reporting to Paul. Um, he, he's not a typical boss, that's why he's a, uh, I treat him as a coach. So uh, once Paul came back then, um, I, I was previously uh, managing an uh, architecture team uh, globally distributed and helping customers on define the solutions architectures. Uh, so I thought of a uh, move to the Paul's team uh, based on some requests came from Tyler as well to start this, uh, looking at this new reference architecture model. So that was his start. So what we did uh, basically, we started uh, Googling and then kind of um, identify what are the reference architecture models uh, available, so and so forth. And then we started reading various stuff. My reading pattern changed. We were reading a lot of uh, strategy-related stuff, as well as uh, we started uh, looking at what kind of research papers published by different um, educational academic uh, papers as well. And Paul is based in London. I'm based in San Francisco. So we did, uh, Paul came back to La San Francisco a couple of times. I flew here. So we did a lot of whiteboard sessions um, as well as we talked to a couple of customers as well, specific customers, including uh, Jennifer, and then uh, shared our ideas. OK, this is what we think and what you, um, uh, uh, what are your thoughts and how these things can apply in the real world, so and so forth. So that's the first exercise that we did. So then we refer some of the uh, other stuff, like about quantum computing, and then some really cool features introduced by Kubernetes, one of the greatest uh, uh, container orchestration systems available. And then we looked at uh, the, the biological concepts and system biology as well. So tomorrow, Paul is giving a keynote, and he will explain more about these biological concepts. Uh, then uh, another thing that we did, um, looked at the business versus technical services, because we write services using various technologies and framework, but what kind of an expectation business is having, this is another thing that we considered. So if you look at, this is a service, right? For most of us, service is nothing, just set of code. Uh, that uh, will have uh, some kind of a network accessible uh, interface. So basically, uh, there's a binding, and then there's a protocol to access it, like HTTP, JMS, AMQP, MQTT kind of protocols, and then there's a message format like JSON or uh, XML uh, like that. And if you look at a uh, code, it's basically you just write the usual uh, programming, and then you annotate it and make it a service. So that is the uh, definition, technical definition of a service. So it's not different when it comes to microservices as well, same concept, uh, but um, you kind of divide the uh, monolithic service into small set of services based on the scope. A lot of people think it's about size, but it's not the size, it's the scope. Uh, so the same thing, and if you look at uh, the a code, um, similar concept, you write the code and then uh, make it a service by using other language constructs or uh, by annotation. So this is a code from the ballerina language uh, Tyler explained. And if you want to learn more, you can uh, go to the ballerina day on day three. So this is the technical uh, definition of uh, microservices. So if you look at the business definition or the expectation from a service, it uh, is looking for a solution for a business problem. So when you are try to deliver a business um, solution, then you had to connect all these services and then uh, provide a business-friendly interface from uh, these services. That's where the gateways and uh, the composite services came into the picture. Then the expectation about the, uh, the microservices, again, same, that it's looking for uh, a business a solution for a business problem, so we have to connect the microservices. Like when you write few services, you will be okay, but when you add more and more services into the picture, you need to uh, connect these services and then do service composition. So the, uh, the concepts like uh, service mesh even came into the picture because of this problem, because you need to connect uh, many services and provide uh, these capabilities. So then the, uh, the uh, thing I need to highlight, so you have to group the services, right? So this was the fundamental thing we identified. So there are some grouping, and then we call the grouping as a cell. So we use the term cell because um, every uh, thing built based on cells, and it, we thought it's a good uh, way to explain an enterprise architecture as well. So let's uh, dig in deep into the, uh, the architecture pattern. So the, the fundamental stuff inside this architecture, uh, so the, uh, the atomic unit of this architecture, we call it as a component. 
So the component can be anything. It can be a service, it can be a microservice, it can be a function, it can be a database, gateway, whatever the runtime, like different kind of runtimes that we have and running in uh, the data center or a cloud infrastructure, we call it as a component in this architecture. Then the, uh, the collection of these components, we call it as the cell. Uh, so if you look at uh, it has a gateway and then n number of uh, components inside the cell. So I will go in detail uh, during next um, uh, few slides. So then the, uh, the relationship in between the cell and component, uh, in many cases it will be one to many, but um, it's not blocking that you can have a one to one. Uh, relation as well, but in uh, most cases it will be one to many. Then the uh, cells need to connect like internally with uh, the components need to connect with each other as well as cells need to communicate with each other to provide uh, some kind of um, value for the business. So then these two concepts like uh, data plane and the control plane playing a role here. So I took an example uh, from um, railroad and a train that um, uh, explain this concept. The control plane uh, is basically uh, it's basically signal signaling of the network as well as it makes the decision about the traffic flow, uh, like um, a controller here and how the switching happens. Data plane is the actual layer that takes the data, so it takes the data packet. So these two concepts we used uh, when it comes to the uh, cell to cell communication. So there are two levels, intercell communication and intracell communication. So if you carefully look at, so we have a control plane associated with the gateway within the cell to do the uh, uh, intracell communication, and there's a data plane within that. And there's a, a common or a, a public data plane and a control plane as well that will help to communicate in between these uh, cells. Then the, uh, the connection happens in this way. So ingress call to a cell always come through the cell gateway, but the egress calls can uh, avoid the uh, gateway and uh, go uh, to a different cell. So there are three patterns in microservices and container world, the sidecar adapter and ambassador. So you can use all these three patterns when you communicate uh, within the cell. So that is how the uh, cell to cell communication will work. Then the architecture is API-centric because uh, all these components will communicate using APIs as well as the cell will expose the functionality um, uh, to the outside using an API. So API can be request response, it can be publish and subscribe, like event-based thing, or it can be streaming. So based on your application needs, you can decide what kind of an API that you um, will be uh, exposing from the cell. Then the, uh, the cell gateway playing a massive role, and then that is called the gateway pattern. It's nothing new. Even from ancient time, people use this pattern to control the uh, traffic coming to a certain place. Um, so when you have a set of gateways, you know exactly uh, from where the traffic coming, so it's easy to control. So we uh, are using the gateway pattern for two things. One is we can enforce policies because now we know all the communication to this set of microservices inside the cell coming through the gateway, and gateway can link to a policy store, uh, take those policies and apply it at the, uh, when the uh, message come and hit the gateway, so that is one. And then the next thing is the problem with the observability. So now we can enforce the observability without bothering the developer. Developer will do the coding about the business logic, and the architecture supports it because uh, we can capture the uh, communication happens uh, like coming to the cell as well as going out and uh, uh, take all the uh, transactions and log it and have a proper observability framework, framework as well. So that is how the gateway patterns help. Then the security of the cell can work in two ways. A cell can um, uh, contain all the necessary information to make a security call, or it can get the help outside from uh, the uh, global control plane, like these two patterns. So in the first example, when the cell um, loaded at the boot time, it will contain all the information required to make an authorization, authentication, or an entitlement call, and uh, the internal security token service will uh, handle it. But in many cases, you might have to go outside. So the outside uh, policies will be in the uh, common or the, the outside control plane, and it will help 
um, the internal uh, the security layer to make that decision. And to make the, uh, uh, this uh, very efficient, you can even cache some of the decisions as well as policies into the local cell. So this is how the security will work. So we are working on a detailed paper on this with uh, our VP of Security Architecture, Prabhat Sriwardhan. So um, we will publish it soon, because this is one area that we need to get in detail, uh, because security is key in uh, most of the uh, application that we build. Then what is the developer experience of this? So when uh, it comes to cell creation, there can be multiple ways. First thing, a developer might create a brand new cell, like in the top diagram, and then he will modify and add features to that. So that is one. And another uh, approach is if you have like microservices running and then written this stuff, then you can use those microservices and create a cell out of that and start maintaining this. And then there can be um, uh, the updates need to be done to a cell, and you can create new version of the cells as well. That way, other reusability comes. So all these things are possible. Uh, however, the uh, developer experience, like uh, usually what a developer do day to day, will not change with this architecture pattern, a developer will come and write some code. Basically, that's a component that we uh, develop. And then he will commit it to the local repo and then test it. If the test pass, he will push it to the remote repository. If it fails, then he will debug and go through that life cycle. Then once he push to the remote repo, there can be multiple options there. But uh, in most common case, will be the CI CD process will take care of the deployment and deploy it to the uh, one environment. And um, uh, if there's no CI CD process, then even the developer can uh, run the deploy uh, process and then deploy it uh, to the um, environment. So there are two uh, patterns. One is uh, a cell can be immutable, that uh, every time you, uh, when you change a component or add a new component, you deploy the entire cell into the environment. Or it can be just a component that um, uh, the deployer will update the component and redeploy. So if you are updating the, um, a component, the uh, deployer will call the control plane inside the cell and then do the deployment. And if you are introducing a new cell, the deployer will call the common control plane and deploy the cell and introduce it as a new cell or a uh, version of the existing cell as well. So, and then the developer will get feedback and he will go through this cycle. So uh, his day-to-day -day experience or the way he code, or he or she code will not change that they will continue this iterative process. So that is how it will work. So, the, um, uh, so some of the things that I think Tyler mentioned about this salary project that we are working on, so it's totally depend on uh, this concept, how you can create a cell, and then how you take it through this life cycle of a cell. So the um, if life cycle of a cell, when it, we look at uh, in a, uh, a runtime environment, it looks like this. So it can have many stages based on the environments that you need to test this thing. And if you look at the version two of the cell, uh, sorry, the cell two version three, it has uh, two environments, test and dev. But uh, the uh, uh, two seven version, it has only two um, environments, and each and every component maintain its own, own version as well. But if you are using a, a containerized environment, you don't need to run all these environments. Whenever you require, you can spin up and use it as well. So that is how it works. So this helps to um, um, uh, have these modern uh, deployment patterns like um, blue-green deployments, rainbow deployments, canary deployments, so and so forth. Based on your DevOps needs, you can deploy, test it, and then uh, put it to production uh, without um, in, in a shorter intervals. Then we call this uh, concept as structured agility. Now, if you look at, there are three levels of agility now coming into the picture. At the component level, you can change it and improve it and keep on releasing. At the cell level, you can improve and keep on releasing the cells. And then as a system, you can improve it and release. So uh, it helps um, that agility comes with the, ver com the versioning in the components, versioning of the cells. And then it helps to do the dependency management. And uh, you don't need to wire this stuff, uh, the control plane 
Chains will uh, do the auto wiring, and it provides the reusability as well. There's a concept called a cell registry that you can pull a cell like we used to do in standard libraries and reuse it as well. So it's basically enhancing the microservices architecture and the cloud native architecture by bringing these concepts into the picture. Then those are like individual cells, but when you are building a system, you need to deal with many systems, so that's where the enterprise um, architecture come into the picture. So this is my imagination, like when you have a cellular architecture, it will look like this. So there are many cells running, and I categorize them into four categories. Uh, the, um, uh, the cloud native cells, those are the cells that you de develop using microservices and uh, the uh, greenfield technologies. Those we call as the cloud native cells. But you might be having a lot of legacy data and systems, so uh, you can wrap them by putting a gateway and make a legacy cell. It will not have all the features that we described, but Again, it, you can plug these uh, brownfield technologies into the cellular architecture by um, bringing them as a uh, legacy cell. Then you need to deal with external stuff, right? You might be using a SaaS application that's running in a cloud infrastructure, and you might have to connect with the partner systems because you can't um, uh, deal with your own data and the systems. So those things we call as um, external, external cells. And the, I did the differentiation between the end-use application and the normal cells because the, uh, the functionality is different. So there can be many um, end-use application cells that will provide uh, mobile apps, web apps, and then various kind of IoT uh, capabilities and so forth. So this is um, how I imagine it will look like. So I. Um, I uh, took an example to sorry, explain this concept. Uh, so there are two things, uh, L0 or the level 0 that I use to explain architecture without any technology, and level 1 with uh, some technology uh, 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 selections. So the first one, the le level 0 diagram, this is an order management system. So that's an employee cell. Um, that connects with um, a user store, an external HR system, and an internal database. And there's an order cell that connects with the order management system. And there's a customer cell that connects with the customer CRM system, uh, internal CRM system, as well as an external CRM system. And then the uh, cells in the edge, they are providing capabilities using APIs to the, um, the applications that uh, provide these capabilities to the end users. So this is an example of a uh, cell-based architecture in a real-world system. So if I uh, go to the level one architecture, as I explained earlier, this is not um, this is completely technology independent, so you can pick the technology that you want. So as an example, I use a bunch of um, WSO2 technologies in this one. Uh, this cell is completely uh, built using Ballerina running in Kubernetes, and it connects to our identity server using MySQL. And the second cell, it's uh, different. It's a combination of uh, the Ballerina and then some, of, uh, some other technologies like Nginx act as the gateway and then uh, Spring Boot uh, based services. Um, like that, based on your uh, preference, you can pick the technologies and um, connect with them. So the key feature here is the open interoperability that you should be able to uh, connect these different technologies and use it uh, based on your application needs. So the, uh, how this connect with the agility and the agile teams? Uh, so the agile teams, we call them as um, self-organized teams that will be uh, uh, responsible to plan, build, test, run, and manage these capabilities. So a self-organized team can own a cell or a couple of cells based on their responsibilities that they have and the functionality that they need to um, um, provide to the enterprise. So with that, uh, the uh, distance between the end user and the, um, uh, the development team will get less, so they can get feedback quickly. And then uh, they can use uh, the CI CD stuff and then uh, provide a continuous um, a deployment delivery model. So it's uh, uh, nicely fit into this concept called a podular organization that now they have an architecture boundary as well to organize properly and deliver these capabilities into the uh, uh, enterprise. So Paul will explain in detail about this concept during his keynote tomorrow. Uh, so you will get a better idea with that. 
So now, uh, so you're planning to introduce a new uh, architecture pattern or a concept, but uh, business will not care about it, right? Like you can explain, but they will care like how a success this thing. So we thought of look at um, how you can measure the success because without measuring, it's really hard to um, uh, uh, prove it. So a couple of KPIs uh, we uh, like you to consider uh, this concept called flow time. So basically, you identify the latency in between uh, these activities happening um, in your project. Uh, basically, we have a lot of wait time depending on the dependencies and uh, so and so forth and complexity of the project. So we can identify the flow efficiency by calculating the latency in between these uh, activities. Since the architecture is flexible and uh, independently you can deploy this stuff, uh, the wait time can be minimized and you can have a better uh, flow efficiency. The next thing is uh, this mean time to repair, MTTR, that um, since uh, the cells are independent, if there's a bug or an issue, you can quickly fix it and then put it to uh, the runtime. So that is another uh, KPI that you can use to um, uh, identify the success of the new architecture. And there are two links you can um, uh, go through this uh, information in detail. Then in summary, uh, this is what happening in the cell-based architecture, like it's self-contained, uh, you can deploy it as a unit, and then you can, uh, independent, uh, uh, you can independently um, scale this thing. So there's a talk uh, in the afternoon done by Afkam Asis, our VP of uh, platform architecture, in the uh, architecture track. So he will in detail explain about some of these concepts, like how you can scale, how you can have high availability, how you can deploy, um, uh, implement sales in Kubernetes uh, and Docker kind of information will provide. And then, as I explained earlier, there's a data plane, local data plane, and a global data plane in this architecture to support the uh, communication. So. Um, we released this paper in, uh, I think, July 16th during our US conference. Initially, it was a PDF um, document, and uh, recently I converted the PDF document into Markdown, and you can access it using the, uh, this particular URL. So uh, the idea here is to uh, run this as a community-driven project. Uh, so we re release it uh, under Commons um, uh, license, CC, uh, I think, 4.0. Uh, so you can access the document, and if you feel there are um, improvements that we can uh, make, you can create an issue, or you can send a pull request. So that's the whole idea, making this open and run it as a completely community-driven project. So to summarize, um, uh, this is how I've, uh, uh, my analogy behind how you can use a reference architecture, just like using a GPS system. Uh, I don't think, uh, like uh, today, we don't use the device, but we use the concept. So how it works, like you have your current, uh, where you are, uh, your current um, location, and then you put the uh, location that you want to go. So you, the GPS system will guide you uh, your journey. And if you make a mistake, again, it will put you back into track. So that is how you can use the, uh, uh, the reference architecture. To support that, we introduce this reference methodology as well, because technology is not the only thing that uh, Jennifer explained in detail, how people process uh, those things are associated with these things. So that's where the reference methodology comes. So the, um, you can use a reference architecture and then use it as a guideline. But even when you are driving and going from one location to another location, you need to consider about the uh, quality of the vehicle. So that's basically the technology that you are using in, during this uh, journey. And then the people inside the vehicle, especially the driver, so you need to consider that as well. And then you have to uh, pay attention to the, uh, uh, the road conditions. That's, be, uh, that's basically the market, what's really happening in the market, what kind of technologies and updates happening. And then again, you have to be careful with the, um, uh, the vehicles running, uh, driving parallelly, Those, that's your competition. You need to keep an eye on that as well if you have to have a successful journey. So I would like to finish my uh, talk with this uh, a quote, basically. Uh, so we introduced this new concept, uh, but we are not expecting you to have an overnight uh, uh, transformation because uh, you can't do that. Uh, so we, what we recommending, I, I like uh, even Massimo explain about the maturity model. So it's a step by step thing. So you can improve your layered architecture first, 
and then you can um, uh, move to a segmented architecture, and then you can move to a cell-based architecture. A lot of uh, customers who's kind of um, trying to use this thing, what they are doing, uh, they are improving their existing architecture, and then if there's a new project, coming, they are planning to use the um, uh, cell-based architecture. And there are a bunch of customers who's running a couple of uh, innovation uh, centers and then a few projects to try out this um, concept as well. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a journey. Uh, like, uh, you have to um, uh, identify the people process and then the business requirements and apply this thing. Uh, so um, what we think we have done a start to a common problem most of the architects are facing. And uh, I, uh, again, highly, um, I, I would like to invite you to contribute to this uh, effort and then uh, send some feedback and pull requests as well as try to use it and then provide feedback for us to improve this thing. So I think it was helpful, and um, thank you very much. <laughs>